thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Apostle Paul and the Silas and their mission team. Thank you for the, really, the gospel trail that they blazed in obedience to your direction. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this this morning, that we would be encouraged and that we would see that we can follow you. And uh, you'll do things that just will amaze us if we will simply let you lead and trust you as you do so. I pray that you would show each one of us individually that you've set before us open doors and that uh, we can see you open and shut <coughs> doors as we see here and uh, just be available to you. And just marvel when it's all said and done at, at what you have accomplished through people, ordinary people. Lord, give us that kind of vision and give us that kind of understanding and heart in our own lives and our own experience that Jesus might be pleased and that at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, that we can look back through verse 12, we've already quickly, we've read it publicly together, and uh, we've just skimmed it quickly together again. Here's the first opening, verses 6 to 12. I say that this is God opening the pathway. And every step of the way, the Holy Spirit of God is leading. Do you know what it is to sense the leading of the Holy Spirit in your personal daily life? If you don't, it is so vital to Christian living. And what you see is that the Holy Spirit of God not only told them when to go, but he told them when to stop. There is a, a famous verse in Psalm 37 that goes like this. The steps of a good man or person are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. You know what? God not only orders a believer's steps, but he will order our stops also. And that's exactly what we see pictured here. He'll tell you when to go. He'll tell you where to go. He'll tell you when to pause. He sometimes totally redirects. And uh, you simply have to know this is God's leading. To know what he's saying. To follow his leading. And trust him. You know what? Sometimes the way that God may lead us may not make sense to us. Not always, but sometimes it just doesn't make sense. I mean, come on. Why would God take a farm girl, grew up on a dairy farm, and dump her in the middle of Brooklyn, New York? Does that make sense? To human thinking, that doesn't make sense, does it? She grew up feeding calves bottles, watching calves be born. And God puts her in Brooklyn, New York. Not a whole lot of cows here. Not a whole lot of dairy farms. See, sometimes it doesn't seem to make sense, but God knows what he's doing. And this is where we have to learn to trust him. This is where we have to just believe that God is in control. When God guides us, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One thing he does in leading us is he, he controls us by giving inward prompting deep inside of us, in our inner man, in what the Bible calls the heart, which is the command center of human personality. He gives inner urges and prompting. I don't know if you've experienced that, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. In conjunction with that, often he will, as we see right here, he will give over, uh, overruling external circumstances where God will close a door that we thought we were supposed to walk through. He'll close that door. And, uh, but he uses, you know, one of the things that uh, really blessed me, and this is really all I, I guess I, I wanted from Jordan's trip over uh, to Mongolia for 
two and a half months this past summer. When he came back, I said, okay, what's the, what's the main lesson that God taught you there? And uh, basically, it was this, that I know that I can trust the Lord to lead me anywhere on this globe, and he's going to take care of me. He's going to show me step by step. And so as a result, I'm willing to live like that. And to me, that was a great, uh, a great thing that he experienced. Now, let's look, first of all, in verses 6 and 7 of Acts 16 and see how God stopped the steps of Paul and his mission team because he closed a door, an opportunity. He closed that eastern corridor. Uh, they wanted to go to the northeast uh, of, of what is Turkey. They tried, they were trying and, and hoping to enter new territory uh, to bring the gospel. And I'm not sure how God revealed his will, uh, but it says in that, uh, as they were preparing, verse 6, to go into that northeast region, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to do so. They were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to do so. They tried. God shut the door. And I'm sure there might have been, maybe not, uh, some initial disappointment on their part. But we don't fear because later on, it was God's plan that they would go there. Where they had planned to go at that moment, God said, not now, but later. And chapter 18 and 19 of the book of Acts, guess where they are? They're in that area that God just closed the door to. So when God says stop, when God closes a door, it doesn't mean that it's permanently closed. Sometimes, but not always. This is why we have to be in tune with the Lord. This is why we have to learn to discern his leading, because we want to be led by the spirit and not by just human wisdom. And so God's at work. He stops them. He closes that eastern corridor for the time, and he redirects them. Look at this. It says in verse 7, they, uh, they were stopped. The spirit suffered them not. And so they continued down the route. They came to Troas, and that's where he had that vision. A man of Macedonia in a vision says to him, come over, cross the Aegean Sea, come over into Macedonia, leave Turkey, come to Greece, come to Europe, if you will, and uh, preach the gospel to us there. Help us with our spiritual needs. No. I hope you understand, because this is vital to see, that that Macedonian vision, as it's called, that takes place in verse 9 and redirects Paul and the mission team in verse 10, he said, after he had seen the vision, immediately, didn't waste any time, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Why? Because as a result of that vision, we were dead Sure, we were assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel there at this point. So, get the idea? There's a stop. There's a closed door. But then, there's a step. There's an open door. And the open door is not to go east, but to go west. I don't know if he's a young man. Go west, young man. He was... He was to go west and not east. But here's the point that I wanted to make. Not only is he entering new territory by going west, but the fact of the matter is, this is the beginning of the evangelization of the continent of Europe. Really, the Western world. When you think about it, this is amazing. You see, the point is this. When God is speaking to you, when God is leading you, when you have God's guidance in your life, it's never a trivial thing. 
whenever you're in the will of God and God is leading you along, it is vital. This is the open door to the European continent, and it starts in Macedonia. And you'll find Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 15, saying, I'm not stopping there. I want to go farther west. He not only went to Rome, but he also wanted to go to Spain. And we're not told that he ever got there, but I believe he did. But Paul wanted to go to Spain. Back in that day, it was called Tarshish, Spain. In any way, the Holy Spirit led. God opens doors, God closes doors. How does it, uh, how is it the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3? I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. You could also say, and I think it does, I've closed the door, and no man can open it. Okay. This is how God opens the pathway. God opens the way for evangelism. God wants to use you and I every day of our lives, whether you are on the job or just in a neighborhood or at a bank or at a store. If you will look to the Lord, he will open the pathway for you. And he'll tell you when to stop and when to go. You'll see God doing wonderful things. You don't have to be on a foreign field as a missionary to see God lead like this. And God use you. He will give what we call divine appointments. He will set up opportunities, open doors for you that you look back on. And you say, whoa, it's amazing what God does. So God opened the pathway. There's a second opening or opportunity I want us to see here. And it's not a pathway, but it's a person that God opens here. You can take the, the, the map down now, please. Thanks. And uh, for this Let's go to verse 13. Now they're in Philippi. Now they're in Macedonia. Here's their, their first uh, real ministry that's recorded here. On Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, Paul said, actually we, it's Luke that's writing. Luke writes the book of Acts. So when he says we, he's part of the mission team. So it's Paul, Silas, and Luke, at least, probably more. On Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, by the way, the city of Thyatira was, is, um, yeah, it was on the map, I, but uh, we won't go back there. But it's in what is modern day Turkey. OK, uh, the city of Thyatira was where she was from originally, and that city was famous for its purple dye. And uh, she was a seller, it says, of purple. In other words, she she sold this purple dye and the clothing that uh, that was made from it. And it says in the 14th verse. She worshiped God. She worshiped God, and she heard us. That is, she heard Paul's and the mission team's message, whose heart the Lord opened. There's the second opening, right? Not only the pathway, but here the opening is a person, a person's heart. The Lord opened it, and she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she judged, uh, she besought us, saying, If you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and, and bide there. And she constrained us. Here really is God's method. And I want you to back up with me to verse 13. God's method has always been, you can trace this through the entire book of Acts to the Jew first. The entire book of Acts. Every place that Paul goes, without exception, he goes to the Jewish people first. And in doing so, he snags Gentiles as well for the gospel. What happens here? There's no synagogue, obviously. So instead of, uh, uh, since there's no synagogue, he went to the riverside. And the riverside is really an idiom for a place where 
Jewish people would gather on Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, if there was not a synagogue. The fact that there wasn't a synagogue in the city of Philippi means that there were probably not 10 Jewish men that uh, would make up a minion. There was women, Jew, uh, uh, Jewish women, obviously. I don't know that Lydia is a Jewish woman because she is called here one that worshiped God, which would probably indicate that she was what would be called a God-fearer. That is a Gentile that had joined herself uh, to the Jewish people uh, to learn of God and uh, to uh, connect with him. And so that's who she is. And as a result of that, and by the way, the Jews gathering by the riverside would make a lot of sense because usually they would meet by riverside in order that they could uh, uh, accommodate the ritual cleansing that was necessary uh, for proper worship. Especially we're talking about a group of women here. Remember in Psalm 137.1, uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down. Uh, why are they by the rivers of Babylon? There wasn't a synagogue, and they were gathering there to worship the God of Israel. So Lydia is a God-fearer. She's not a proselyte to Judaism, but she is connected uh, with them as a God-fearer. It says the Lord opened her heart. We're in Acts 16, verse 14. The Lord opened her heart. God opened her this person up to the message of the gospel. And as a result, she's born again. Now, this is, this is significant. And remember, it was a man that Paul saw in a vision. He saw a man of Macedonia. The first convert in Macedonia isn't a man. It's a woman. And the fact of the matter is, she is not just a woman that is saved. She is the first person ever saved in the continent of Europe. The first European convert is Lydia. Isn't that amazing? One reason I wanted to, I wanted to call one of my daughters Lydia, because this, this is so, I, it so connects with me. God opened her heart, and my wife said, well, you can use that as a middle name, because they all have to start with J. So <laughs> it's Joy Lydia. And so... I, I love this passage for a long time, and it's special to me, and I'll tell you uh, in, the, in the afternoon why this is so special to me, this passage, and how God connected my heart with this. But anyway, she's the first European convert, and she's a woman. So that's God's method. God's means is he opens this woman's heart. You know what God does? He opens people's hearts. If you're a believer here today, and I think the, the vast majority of us would claim to be believers, you know why you are? Because God opened your heart. No one gets saved if God doesn't open their hearts. We're all believers if God opens our heart. That's God's means. He softens hearts. He can take the hardest heart, and he knows how to soften them. He knows how to break us, doesn't he? He knows how to deal with us. He puts us sometimes in, a, in, a, in an oven, in a crucible, and he, he heats it up, and uh, it gets really hot, but it, it has a, a way of softening us as well and opening our hearts up to the Lord so that we listen. You know, since I've been saved, I, I'm hard-headed, and I say, Lord, please, you know, teach me to be soft so that you don't have to beat me up in order for me to, because uh, I'm, I'm not courageous either. I don't like getting hurt. And so, Lord, keep my heart tender. Keep my heart soft so you don't have to beat me over the head, so to speak, in order to get my attention. Not that God's a bully. Not that God's mean like that. But you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying. I want, I want my heart to be soft so that it's open to the Lord. So I'm listening to him. I'm paying attention to him. I'm believing. That's what it means. He opened her heart so that she listened to the message of the gospel and she believed it. 
And as a result of that open heart, look at what she wants to do. In verse 15, she wants to open her home. You open your heart, and you open everything to the Lord. She wanted him and the team to abide with her, to stay with her. And what you find also, I'm not going to turn there, but the book of Philippians, which we're going to look at next week, the book of Philippians is, for all practical purposes, a thank you note that Paul started to write. Put a lot in it before he got to the thank you part. But in the end of that book of Philippians, as he thanks the church, he thanks them for opening their hand to the gospel ministry and to missions. So an open heart, an open home, and an open hand. It's all pictured here. That's God opening the person. But there's a third, and this is really the main part of uh, our lesson here this morning. There's a third opening. God opened the pathway. God opened the person. That's Lydia. Now, thirdly, God opened the prison. God opened the prison because here's what happened. In verse 16, it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, young woman, possessed with a spirit of div divination. Here's a demonized young lady, uh, sometimes called demon-possessed. She's a demonized young woman uh, that has the ability to fortune tell, okay? It's a fortune teller. By the way, sidebar, don't ever bother with horoscopes and fortune tellers. You know, I remember you can walk down the sidewalk. Uh, I, I think I was on Avenue U in the Chinese section, and there was a, there's a, uh, uh, a sign right out on the sidewalk, and uh, young women sitting out there wanting to tell you your fortune. Don't mess with that. That's not from the Lord. Everything that God wants you to know, he'll show you in his word. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. Don't fall for that, because if you fall into that, you really are dealing with forces other than God. Okay? So it's a danger. But anyway, here's this uh, demonized woman, fortune tell fortune teller, and uh, the men that were using her were making a lot of money off of her uh, demonic ability. And in verse 17, this woman followed Paul and his mission team, and they cried, and she cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto you the way of salvation. She did this for many days. Now, you would think, well, you know, that's, that's good. Yeah, she's identifying uh, Paul as a gospel preacher. It's not good. This is, this is resistance. This is satanic opposition, even though what she said was true. This is actually satanic opposition. Don't ever forget this. The door of opportunity that God opens to us always swings on the hinge of opposition. Whenever you step forward in a door that God's opened, mark it down, you're going to find opposition somewhere along the way. You're going to be opposed. Because the evil one, the enemy, does not simply sit by idly and let you do the will of God. Always you're going to be opposed. And so what we have here is resistance, satanic opposition. It's Satan, because he does not want salvation to be proclaimed. Even though she was telling the truth about these men, he does not want people to be saved. you know why? Because according to Romans 11, there's going to come a time when salvation, when the Great Commission is so successful that the full number of Gentiles will be saved. And when that happens, the Messiah will return. And when the Messiah returns, Israel will have an awakening and will be restored. And then the end will come. And that's Satan's demise. So Satan and his hosts, they know if they can kick the can down the road long enough, uh, they, 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 they may not be able to do away with God, 
but they'll be able to exist longer. And so if Satan can keep you and I back from witnessing, if Satan can keep us back from telling people about salvation, seeing people saved, if he can delay the fullness of the Gentiles from coming in, then he survives longer. That's the mentality here. He knows he can't overthrow God. He knows he'll never be able to do away with God. But their success and their victory is in the area of just prolonging their existence. And so this is why Satan opposes gospel preaching. This is why Satan opposes our witnessing. He doesn't like us to do that. And so there's resistance. There's satanic opposition here. And look at the method that he uses initially. He has this demon-possessed girl saying, hey, these guys are, you know, they're telling you the truth. An alliance with the devil, if you will. And uh, that's a false friendship. The devil isn't on our side ever. This is a, this is a subtlety. You know, the devil will speak things that have elements of truth in it. All false religions has elements of truth in it. For instance, Roman Catholicism is a false religion. Clear? It's a false religion because it is not salvation by grace, but it is a teaching of salvation by works. But there's a lot of truth in Roman Catholicism, you see? And so this is what the devil does. This is how, first of all, his resistance is he wants to make an alliance with the truth. What he's, what he's saying through this woman is it's, it's a true testimony about believers and about these missionaries. But folks, it is a danger to ever cooperate with this kind of thing. Never go along with the powers of darkness hoping that some good will come of it. It won't. We can't compromise with darkness. We can't compromise with false religion, hoping that as a result, you know, the gospel will, will prosper. It won't happen. We need to learn simply to trust God to break through whatever hindrance the devil gives to the gospel. There's a second tactic that he used. When that doesn't work, when the, the, the alliance, the compromise doesn't work, look what happens. <clears throat> In verse 18, she did this many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the demonic spirit in this woman, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour, and when her masters, her, her employers, saw the hope of their gains were gone, they weren't able to make money off this fortune teller anymore, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, the town council, brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, because we're Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, commanded to beat them, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they beat them. They cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. See, when Satan can't subtly get us through an, a, an unholy alliance with him, the second thing he'll do then is just outright antagonism. And here it is in this kind of persecution where a mob is incited. There's anti-Semitism, of course, involved in this. These guys are Jews. And then they are beaten. They're tortured. They're, they're put in stocks. Their feet, actually, they stretch their legs so far out, it's extremely painful, and put them in that position as wide apart as possible. The pain is so great, you can't sleep. So instead of sleeping, you know what they did? Look at their response. Pick it up with me in this chapter. In the 25th verse, and at midnight, see, they're not sleeping. 
They're still awake. It's midnight. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So there is, first of all, there's resistance. That's satanic opposition. But look at the response. The response of the believer to satanic opposition is really to see it as God's opportunity, a really an opening. What do you do when you can't sleep? What do you do when you're in pain? They prayed and they sang hymns. And it says the prisoners heard them. Now, when they prayed, I just don't think that they were praying, Lord, please get us out of this. Lord, please. I don't think that's what they were praying. I think that they were simply expressing an attitude of thanksgiving to the Lord. They were adoring him. They were worshiping him because that's what the prisoners heard. As they sang praises unto the Lord, they heard them. And you know what happened? The prisoners that were listening also experienced with Paul and Silas miracles. <laughs> miracles started happening. The result is absolutely amazing. Several important things happened. And it all is because they didn't have a human viewpoint of their circumstances, but they had God's perspective on it. When you have God's perspective on your, your suffering or on your pain or on your sleeplessness, what happens is God really works. And so miracles happen. Look at the result. An opportunity is opened. Another opportunity. The prison is open, yeah, but that opens up a wonderful opportunity. The praise of these men became a powerful force, became a powerful weapon that actually unleashed the miraculous power of God. And there's an earthquake. Look with me, verse 26. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. All their shackles fell off every prisoner. Wow. Their praise unleashed the power of God. You might say their open lips brought forth the opening of their stocks and their, their chains, their bonds, and the prison doors. Power. Power. Praise brought about the power of God. You know, there's something to that. And when you feel all bound up, tied up, no way out, can I suggest that at that moment you genuinely begin to praise the Lord? Someone spoke to me today about the fact that there's a particular song that's in our hymn book. The words of that song come to their mind throughout the day and just bring praise to their heart. That's something that releases the power of God in your life and through your life. Because you shouldn't be praising, right, when you're hurting. You shouldn't be praising when you're suffering. But God can give you that supernatural ability, it's called grace, to be able to praise him in pain and in prison. There's another thing that happens that really provokes the jailer. Look at what happens in verse 27. The keeper, the prison warden, he wakes up. There's an earthquake. He wakes up out of his sound sleep. He sees the prison doors are swinging open, and he said, oh, I'm done for. If, if this Roman uh, guard would lose his prisoners, he would die. That was the price he would pay. So he's about to commit suicide. You know, Paul could have said, oh, let him do it. You know, we'll just walk free. Oh, let him commit suicide. This pagan, this pagan warden, he recognizes that there is something supernatural. There's a supernatural power that's been released. 
he perhaps recognizes the presence of God in that place. When he awakes, he sees his own personal need. And God opens this man's heart. Look at what happens. He, verse 28, he cried with a loud voice, Paul did, saying, do thyself no harm. We're all here. If he was going to commit suicide, Paul says, stop. You don't need to do that. No one's escaped. And then verse 29, the warden called for light. He ran in before Paul and Silas. He was trembling. He knew God was at work. This is something supernatural happening. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out of their dungeon, and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? See the result? There's power, and that power provokes this pagan jailer and opens his heart, and uh, there's immediate change. His heart is gripped with fear, and uh, he brings them out, and he asks them this question. What must I do to be saved? Now think about it for a moment. That warden was the one person that blocked freedom for Paul and Silas. And he spared them. He spared that man from suicide. And as a result, that man got saved. He wasn't ready to die. He wasn't ready to meet the Lord. He needed to be saved. And Paul did not selfishly protect his own safety, but he felt for this man. He didn't see that man as an enemy, but he saw that man as someone that was perishing, that needed Jesus. I don't know, how do you view your enemies? Have you ever viewed them like that? As a person that is perishing, that needs Jesus? That's how Paul saw this, this jailer. And as a result, that's how this jailer was saved. Because their answer to him, when he asked that great question, Sirs, what must I do to be rescued? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You'll be rescued. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Very simple. It's really the gospel in miniature, that verse. It's simply this. That salvation is only one way. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by faith in Jesus alone. Realize you're lost. He did. Realize you're helpless, you're hopeless, you're hell-bound. And there's only one alternative, and that's Jesus. They spoke the gospel to him, and they simply said, you can be saved if you will believe. That's all it takes. You can be saved... If it's not a matter of earning it. You can't merit salvation. Salvation is not something you ever deserve. It's a personal choice that an individual makes to depend on Jesus alone. That's salvation. That's the only way that it happens. And look at the absolute certainty that Paul says to this man. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt about it, Thou shalt be saved. You will be saved. No uncertainty at all. There's no special formula. You just transfer your dependence from anything else that people depend upon to put them in a good light with God, favor of God. They depend on all kinds of things. They depend upon their religion. They depend upon their, their good works. They depend upon... Uh, their birthright or whatever. No. Depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Transfer dependence totally to him. And, and he says, you'll be saved. And what happens? He says also in that verse 31, and thy house. And thy house. That doesn't mean that automatically when that man got saved, that his whole family automatically got saved. But it means that he is the means through which that whole family was brought to the Lord. You know, I think that when God saves a family member, he intends to save the whole family. I think that's his plan. That's why it's so important that if you are the saved person in your home, 
that God is at work in your life. You let him use you. That people see the difference that the living Christ makes in your life. Sometimes you got to just shut up. You've said enough, okay? And if you continue to preach to them, you just drive a wedge and you drive them away from the Lord instead of bringing them to the Lord. So there comes a time where you just shut up and you live it, where you just show Christ in your life and in your lifestyle, where you show the love of Christ through not getting angry, not becoming bitter, by being forgiven, and so forth. And so, and thy house. If they believe, they also would be saved. One by one, brought his family to the Lord, and so can you. I can't think of a more remarkable scene to happen in the middle of the night, midnight. Wakened out of a deep sleep, and then boom, and total heart change. The family's never the same. And this guy, we're not going to read it, but he he washes the wounds of Paul and Silas. He has care and compassion for them in verse 33. He washes the blood on their cuts, I think, because his sins were washed by the blood of Jesus. And he rejoices because for the first time in his life, he and his family are now right with God. I read a story a long time ago about a Scotsman by the name of John Harper who was traveling to become the pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, and he was traveling on board the ship Titanic. Harper was scheduled to, to take the pastorate when he arrived. Of course, he never made it. However, there was another Scotsman on board the Titanic that did survive the sinking disaster, and he later told how that Harper was clinging to a piece of debris, and he called out across the water to this fellow countryman, and he said, are you saved, man? And he then quoted Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And just before he drowned, he got that verse out, and that young man wasn't saved physically, but he took Harper's invitation to heart, and he put his faith in the Lord right then and there and then lived to tell it. Acts 16, a little slave girl, a businesswoman, a rough prison guard, really kind of a cross section of urban society, you might say. And they're all changed by the power of the gospel. That's how missions started in Europe. That's how mission started in European history. And all of Europe, and as from Europe, America's greatness can be traced back to Acts chapter 16. Amazing. And everything that's wrong with modern Europe and America can be traced back to the fact that we've rejected this Jesus. We've rejected his word. From this chapter, we see God's work as it progresses through challenges, through opposition, and yet it continues to, and to this very day, answer the human need and the human problem. The answer is the gospel. It's Jesus. And these individuals in this chapter really picture lives who are changed or which are changed by God, and really they represent other people all around us, and just like them, they're on board a sinking ship, and they're waiting for someone to rescue them before they drown. And that's you, and that's me. Let's bow together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just continue to take the truth, the wonderful truth of Acts 16, and work it into our heart. This is a, a great stop in the city of Philippi. You did some amazing things there. It looked bad. It looked as if, okay, they made a mistake by stopping in this town. They got beat up. They got tortured. 
They got uh, put in a, a filthy, dirty dungeon. And yet here is the beginning of the church in the little in, in that uh, Roman city of Philippi. Lord, how amazing. Could, would you give us eyes to see the potential of what you would do? If we would simply follow your leading, if we would in faith obedience, let you direct us and that we would uh, we follow. Lord, show these young people how you can use them. This isn't just ancient history. This is stuff that you do today. And Lord, show us all just how much you can do with a simple choice to say, Lord, I want you to lead me. I'll follow you anywhere. I'll do anything you want. Just lead me, Lord. What an amazing work you'll do. Encourage us to not be intimidated, to not be fearful, but to have the boldness and the courage of the Holy Spirit in our lives every day. In Jesus' name.